Welcome to our very special In Conversation to celebrate PRS Foundation's Women Make Music. Women Make Music was launched in response to the low representation of female songwriters and composers in the UK. Since 2011, Women Make Music has continued to break down assumptions and stereotypes within the music industry by encouraging role models for future generations. It's also raised awareness of the gender gap to ensure that women are aware that support for new music is available to them, as well as increasing the profile of women, trans and non-binary artists creating new music in the UK. It's also encouraged women, trans and non-binary artists who may otherwise not have applied for PRS Foundation funding to do so. We have supported some amazing talent from this year's Mercury nominee, Anna Meredith, to London jazz band Cockerocco, who performed at this year's proms. But representation of women in the music industry remains very low. Across Europe and Canada, women represent 20% or less of registered composers and songwriters. Earnings for women are even lower and women are underrepresented in leadership roles across the industry and within festival programs. But times are changing with pioneering initiatives like the PRS Foundation's Key Change, led by Reek Barn Festival and Music Centrum Ost, seeking to transform the future of music whilst encouraging festivals and music organisations to achieve a 50-50 gender balance by 2022. Today, we have seen over 300 music festivals and organisations take the Key Change Pledge and nearly 2,000 women registered as professional songwriters and composers in the UK in 2019, which is up 60% year on year. Today, we are delighted to welcome the folk singer, songmaker and activist Peggy Seeger. At 85, after a lifetime in music, Peggy has been recording and performing since she was 17. At every turn, her career has broken moulds, crossed boundaries and innovated from the groundbreaking radio ballad of the 50s and 60s to her feminist anthem, Gonna Be an Engineer. So no one is better placed to talk about what it is to be a woman in music. And we are so pleased to be able to help fund this, her final album, First Farewell. So I'll hand over to writer and broadcaster Sophie Harris and the amazing Peggy Seeger. Over the course of the last 65 years, Peggy Seeger's musical brilliance and buoyant spirit have helped blaze a trail for folk music and feminism. Hers is an extraordinary story, told with great humility in her autobiography, First Time Ever, that begins with her childhood in Marilyn. Raised in a musical house by parents Ruth Crawford and Charles Seeger, typical guests might include Woody Guthrie, Lead Belly, or Alan Lomax. Peggy's freewheeling adventures in Europe led to her arrival in the, in the UK in 1956. Choosing between the UK and Finland, she thought London sounded more why not-ish, where she met her future husband, the folk singer Ewan McCall. Their singers club became a crucial part of the English folk revival. Their radio ballads reset the parameters of storytelling and the song Peggy inspired, the first time ever I saw your face, is loved all over the world. An activist and an advocate from the get-go, Peggy wrote the brilliantly sharp song, Gonna Be an Engineer, in 1970, which became a feminist anthem. And in the 1980s, she supported the CND Green and Common protests. As a woman making music for nearly seven decades, Peggy Seeger has been on the front line <laughs> quite literally. We'll be talking today about her amazing life and her new album with Women Make Music, First Farewell. Peggy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great honour. It was a very kind and generous introduction, Sophie. Really very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in, entirely true. And as I hope anyone who's, who's read the book and is watching today uh, knows, they, they will also be thrilled as we are. Um, as a woman, how much has changed in the music industry in the past 50 or 60 years? And how much has stayed the same, would you say? I would say there are, well, the, the music industry has changed a huge amount in the last 60 years. There are many more women who are in many different areas of music. 
we talk about boy bands that when I first came over, that was all you saw was a number of boys all taking up poses and whoa, whoa, and looking this way and posing themselves. And now we have girl bands. My son has just made a, a wonderful song uh, with his partner about the NHS. It's called um, um, Working on the Front Line. And the band, the band is all women, uh, excepting for a bass player, I do believe. And just seeing, and they're young women. And room also for older women, white women. Uh, I was, I'm reading a, a, a wonderful book about uh, Bessie Smith by Jackie Kay, the uh, Scottish poet laureate. And she makes a wonderful comment, and she's talking ba basically about black women singers. Mm -hmm. She says the blues, it was interesting, the gender divide in the way they presented themselves. The black women singers made themselves like divas. They had glitter, they had bigness, they had long flowing dresses. She said, and the men made themselves into sad, you know, no good, you know, street, you know, the the difference was enormous. So the variety, as well as the number, especially in the folk scene. When I first came over, it was almost all men playing guitars, uh, very rarely uh, in the folk scene, very rarely a banjo player. Um, and I remember when a couple of women came on the scene, one of them playing a bass, it was rather wonderful. So uh, at the beginning, it was part of the reason that I was accepted the way I was because I was unusual at the time. I was American, I was young, female. I played a long neck banjo. I stomped my feet when I sang. Uh, I knew more folk songs, American folk songs than anybody over here and they'd already been combing Lead Bellies and Woody Guthrie's and Alan Lomax's books, but I'd been brought up with that since I was two. And so I, I had a huge repertoire uh, and, and still do. And that's not boasting, it's just a fact when you get to be 85. Although I say I'm 86, so it's easier when the next birthday comes along. The, uh, the, the, uh, I've had it easy, really easy. Uh, also, you know, when you're 20 and you have long hair and you play a banjo and you're single and you're exotic, uh, <laughs> what else do you want? You know, so, so it was, it, but there weren't a lot of women. There weren't. Presumably coming from the family that you did and having played music since, you know, since the get go as a little, as a little kid, that get, gave you a certain kind of confidence and maybe you felt more allowed to be part of that club in a way i wasn't only confident i was egotistical i was bumptious uh the best word i can think of it is a scots word bringing where you just force your way in uh i practically wedged myself in with the long neck of the banjo i just assumed that what I had was interesting to other people because it was so interesting to me. I had only American folk songs and ones that I had co-opted from English collections, which I did when I was a student at Radcliffe when I was 19 and 20. Um, I used to go to the Harvard Library, which is, the, Radcliffe is the women's part of Harvard. Harvard. So I'd go to the Harvard Library and just get out all the anthologies because America had been anthologized, but not as much as Britain. Britain had collectors going out and getting folk songs, English and Scottish collections that were just staggering. And it was the first time I'd seen those. So I just collected songs from anywhere and just sang them as if they were American. So I Americanized them all within one generation. I guess I'm just thinking about um, the context of the times and you were never a kind of meek retiring wallflower. And then I'm wondering also if there were some women, if you had a sense of women who were musicians and perhaps a bit more shy and 
would have loved to have been more a part of the musical live scene, but kind of didn't have the, the confidence. I don't know about that. Uh, one of the, well, the first female singer that I met over here, I remember particularly two of them. Uh, Shirley Collins was in the group that we worked with. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was Alan Lomax's girlfriend, woman friend. And she didn't push herself forward. She had a lovely voice and she was lovely to look at. And I, I don't know if I, uh, uh, if I threatened her in any way. I don't think so. I was very jealous of her voice because it's a beautiful voice. Uh, and I looked on her as the real thing because mm. I'm not the real thing. I learned from records and books. I was not brought up on the front step of a cabin in the Appalachians. Uh, but I rarely, rarely learned from people who learned from people who learned from people who learned from people. I was very close to the sources because I'd been brought up listening to records of the people on the front steps of cabins, etc. So the other person that I met, a woman singer over here, was Maggie Barry. Do you know about Maggie Barry? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was Irish and she was of traveler origin. I don't know if she was gypsy or traveler. There is a difference. Uh, but she, she had what I think it's a Jewish word, chutzpah. She just pushed herself forward and it didn't matter who wanted to hear her or who didn't. I mean, <laughs> she's, she's most known, I think, she played a banjo kind of as far as i was concerned it was kind of playing mm -hmm. but it didn't matter because she sang out of the corner of her mouth and her voice would go from from piccadilly to hackney uh, she's best known in america for the fact that she was singing in boston and the boston irish community heard about her and they came to the concert now she was not a traditional irish singer she was not um, uh, Joe Heaney. She was not uh, the, the Clancy, Sarah Clancy. She was not Patty Tunney. She was not the Sean Nose singing. She was street singing. And as I said, her voice was enormous. So there she is on stage playing this rather questionable banjo and singing out of the corner of her mouth loud and and making one verse of so long at the fair last for two hours, you know, the way street singers do. And a voice came out from the audience as this guy stood up. He said, you're a disgrace to Ireland, disgrace to Ireland. And she jumped off the stage and hit him over the head with the banjo and, bro and broke the skin of it. Uh, that's the kind of, so these are, I had no idea of what, British singing womanhood was like. I really didn't. Mm -hmm. And there were very, very few women. Because mostly it was uh, Cockneys or Scottish um, Glaswegians singing what they thought was Lead Belly, what they thought was Woody Guthrie, which I found very distressing because I had heard the real thing. And going forward, kind of through the the decades, how much do you think has changed? I mean, do you think that things have improved for women or do you think that there are, just, there are now just different obstacles that women face? Well, women have always been known as the singers. Mm. We haven't been known as the instrumentalists. Mm. You look at an awful lot of the bands and the woman is the singer. She isn't the instrumentalist trying to figure this out, it's probably because they weren't given instruments to play or they were told this is, I mean, like I was told uh, by several men whom I respect that the banjo was, was not a woman's instrument. And essentially, I think it's because you needed energy to play it and you needed to have, uh, you know, you have a certain amount of putting yourself forward because the banjo comes into the room before you do. It really is quite, quite extraordinary. But what has happened in the last 50 years, a lot of it is due, I think, to the fact 
to some of the work that you and McCall and I did, some of it. We formed a group um, to help some British singers who wanted to sing folk songs, but didn't know how to sing them because they, folk songs come with a, a style of singing as well as text and music. There's what things that folk singers do uh, and don't do that is very defining. It's much closer to the spoken language than I think any of the other musics. Because you sing speak when you sing a lot of, or that's mostly the tradition that I remember, Anglo-American. And I only speak as someone who knows the Anglo-American. I, I don't know much about other traditions, quite a bit about Britain. But, but this group that we formed was to help um, people who hadn't been brought up in that style of singing to know how to sing the songs so that we didn't ruin them. For instance, if you sing, uh, if you sing a song like, well, I know a song called um, Peacock Street. It was made up by Aunt Molly Jackson, who was one of my heroines, uh, a very poor miners, uh, wife, daughter, sister, mother of miners. That's the way she described herself. And she wasn't a good singer, but she was a truthful singer. And during the Depression, she made up this song. I'll sing just a little bit. As I was a walking down Peacock Street, no clothes on my back, no shoes on my feet. I was cold, I was hungry. It was late in the fall. I knocked down some old big shot, took his money, clothes and all. Well, they put her in jail. Put him, they put me in jail for a year and a day for taking all that old big shot's money and clothes away. Then they turned me loose about an hour ago for a walk these old streets in the rain and snow. This is the way she sang. Got no money for room rent. I got nothing to eat. We just can't live by walking the street. Now that has a style of singing. And that's the way she sang. I'm not imitating her what I'm doing is, is is sing speak half recitative if you sang that as I was a walking down Peacock Street you take away the truth of it and I think a lot of the truth of folk songs is taken away when you take it away out of the style in which it was made and not all of the old folk singers were brilliant interpreters they didn't look on themselves as interpreters they were singing in their communities they sang the songs made by their communities now this is ideal speak it's not like that anymore at least i don't think so most of the people now who sing folk songs are middle class more comfortable and for the most part folk songs have been made up by the least comfortable classes the economic class that's just down at the bottom of the economic heap. That's why they make them, made them up, and that's why they're so truthful, because they talk about how the, the, that, that class felt about where they were in the social pecking order. So what's happened now mm. is there's a lot of women singers who are, um, who are singing in folk songs. I mostly know among the English um, singers and I will say with shame that I don't listen to a lot of music. I was taught that when music is being played or sung you don't talk, you don't work at something else. You can wash the dishes, you can iron, you can have a bath but you don't uh, do it while your brain is churning over something else. As my, I have a heavy workload, really heavy workload, and I find that I can't have my brain to myself when I listen to music. So I don't hear a lot of the other singers. Um, I really like Kareen Polwart's work. I like Emily Smith. I like what Sandra Kerr does. She, but the 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 group that we we made. I think we we turned out one or two, three, four, five, some good singers. And I learned a huge amount from the group. 
a really big amount. So I'm pushing this because one of the things that the group said was that it's very hard. Let's try and see if I can encapsulate this. There's quite a number of Anglo-American songs that I don't sing. Mm -hmm. I don't sing any Woody Guthrie. I can't identify with the social strata that he came from. I can't get that flatness of singing that is so effective when he sings. I don't sing Lead Belly because I wasn't in, 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 in a, I wasn't a black man in a prison for murder. Uh, and the, the whole mental uh, state that you go into when you sing, there has to be something, something that you understand in it. When I sing Peacock Street, my mind goes away to my being in Poland with no money, frozen uh, with uh, pleurisy in a student uh, in a student dormitory where nobody knew me and I was just lying in bed cold and shivering and didn't know anybody couldn't speak Polish now that's not like being out of work in the depression but it has a bit of what we call emotional memory so I can remember I was cold I was hungry I had no money I didn't know anybody and if it hadn't been for the girl students who occasionally brought me something to eat I would have died and a lot of the homeless do die on the streets and they did die during the depression. So, so this is what we taught. And when you are British trying to sing Lead Belly, trying to sing Woody Guthrie, it, it doesn't work. And if you're Scottish and you hear somebody from London singing a Scots song, you immediately, goodness, what's happened to the vowels? Uh, what's happened to the, the Scottishness of this song? Now, you can look at, yeah, I'm, I, this, is, this is a big thing, I think, because folk songs are so special. They really are special. They have not been created for a rich patron. They haven't been created for, for profit. They haven't been made so that it'll go to the top of the what we used to call the hit parade and make you famous. People have taken folk songs and become famous by using one of them. Paul Simon did that. And I think Bruce Springsteen has done that. Uh, and in doing so, they change, change them so that they're not folk songs anymore. So what we did in the critics group was to try and teach style as well as identification with the subject, as well as emotional memory and, uh, and working your way into understanding how the song was made. And in doing that, we, uh, we instigated what we called the policy at our club, our folk club, i.e. if you're North American, you sing North American songs, preferably from the area where you came from. And that's what I do. I sing mostly Northeastern, uh, songs almost all uh, and we didn't we stopped having at the club we stopped having israelis who were singing russian songs israelis who didn't uh, speak russian or french people who were singing portuguese songs or african people who were singing songs from finland because it, they didn't sound truthful and we made a lot of enemies for the first couple of years but then people began realizing that those people who sang songs from where they came from had something that nobody else had. Mm -hmm. And essentially what it was was identification with their own life, joining their own life to the songs they were singing, understanding that this is part of our cultural history. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, I think some of the best singers that, that I know sing songs from their own area or they sing songs from these islands. Um, I, but I don't, I'm not really in touch enough with the folk revival. I know what I like and what I don't like. And as I'm terribly opinionated, there's a lot that I don't like. 
I mean, for instance, uh, this country has a huge, uh, for the most part, uh, the singers in this country, the folk singers, the real ones, the real people, they didn't play instruments while they sang. It was mostly unaccompanied. And when a song is unaccompanied, I would never think of accompanying Peacock Street. Never, never, never. I wouldn't even know how to start doing that. Maggie Barry would do it. She'd know how to do it. She'd just strum the, the, the banjo a little bit in between each line and, and do it with such panache that she was genuine. <laughs> so we, we started just pushing, trying to sing the, the British songs the way they were originally conceived. Yeah. And that's, and there, because of this, there are a lot of excellent singers, men and women uh, in, in the folk scene in this country now. Really, really good. Are you, do you feel aware of what's going on in the kind of the popular music scene and the, the sort of big hitters? Not much, <laughs> not much. Um, you, you talk quite often in your book about the fact that you'll say, I was not yet a feminist then, mm -hmm. when you talk about some of your early adventures. And I wonder, would you or could you have done anything differently earlier on if you had been a feminist? Oh, yes. Yeah. Before I began really studying feminism, which was in about 1971, 72, because I'd written going to be an engineer as an exercise for a theater show. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't read, I didn't write it from personal experience. I never wanted to be an engineer. I was just very impressed by seeing some women engineers in mm -hmm. factories where we were doing radio programs. So, <clears throat> so before then, I was singing some horribly misogynistic songs. Oh, I had a wife and got no good of her. Here is how I easy got rid of her. Took her out, chopped the head off her early in the morning. Seeing as how there was no evidence for the sheriff or his reverence, they had to call it an act of providence early in the morning. So, if you're, if you have a wife and get no good of her, here is how you easy get rid of her. Take her out and chop the head off her early in the morning. That was a Puritan song, folk song. Mm -hmm. I was singing stuff like this. I was singing songs in which husbands beat their wives without a comment. Did you feel uncomfortable about it at the time? Nope, nope. don't think so. Nope. And, and, and the man I was singing with, he was singing songs about women being, being transported because they were nagging their, their husbands. What I would love to know is if there were if there was a eureka moment for you, or if it was a gradual build up over the years of just a shift in your consciousness. Now, after I wrote Gonna Be an Engineer, the feminists went wild over it and invited mm -hmm. me to their meetings. And when I'd sung it they, sing it, they said, sing us another. I didn't have another. I had no other. No. So I was very perturbed because I, they were talking to me about feminism, but I was living with a man, a uh, good man. Uh, I, mean, I began to realize how gender divided we were uh, with the jobs in the house, with the, the, with the, uh, I, I, did, I did so much, I, I cooked. I didn't do much cleaning because the, 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 our arrangement that we had, my mother-in-law lived with us for 16 years in the house and she did a lot of that. But because we toured so much, we always had someone else living in the house. But whenever I was home, I was the, I was the shopper, I was the planner, I was the one who took the kids to the dentist. I was the one who, when we came home from a concert, I put the instruments away and made the list and brought the tea to him in bed. I thought, you know, and for the most part, he was upstairs working and writing. Duh. And I, that seemed natural to me. But when I started talking to feminists, 
and got their take on it, I thought, there's something I've missed here. <laughs> so I started looking into the, the issues of, 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 of feminism, and I made what I call a soft feminist album, which is called Penelope Isn't Waiting Anymore. Uh, it's mostly fairly gentle feminist songs, but when I started doing feminist reading, then I wrote Different Therefore Equal, and I took the issues one by one by one by one, and I started interviewing women about the different subjects and writing songs from experience, and that was an eye-opener, and that happened for about, from about 1971, 72, 73, and that was me just plunging into fe feminism. Compared to what some of the feminists have done and the real activist, I'm a soft activist. I'm, I've written songs and some of them are very good. They are very good. I don't know that I've actually written a feminist song that, that, that didn't work for me. I've written some movement songs that to me didn't quite fly but the feminist ones, probably because I interviewed so many women about them whose lives were really very, very uncomfortable. But uh, maybe it's the variety of the songs that I wrote because the critics group that we worked with, they, one of the things that we latched onto very strongly was that concentration of an audience has a limit. Most singers have a comfort zone. And if you leave us to it, we'll just sing song after song. After song. Okay, the new album is called First Farewell. And I got the idea of, of the title from my, my brother Mike's rather quixotic, uh, uh, they talked about their yearly concert as a part of the New Lost City Ramblers group. He called it the um, annual farewell concert, you know, mm -hmm. which I think is rather wonderful. So mm -hmm. this felt to me like a first farewell tour because at 85, 86, I think there comes a time when you have to give up. My, my uh, barometer for giving up is twofold. First of all, my body fails. Second of all, my voice fails. <laughs> uh, so far, my voice has changed a whole lot. I, I don't sing so many high songs. My hands have serious arthritic problems. Um, I, but I love, 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 love singing low. I really love singing low. So when the time came to make uh, this album, I have moved everything down to a fairly lower range. I'm, I'm really pleased with what we're doing. I am. Uh, and Callum is recording it uh, and he directs it. Uh, yeah, he produces it, he does the whole, the whole shoot. And he's a merciless critic, absolutely merciless. And if we have to do that line 20 times over, then I have to do it 20 times over. Uh, but doing that made me realize how questionable my voice can sometimes be. Sometimes I can just get so tired that my voice stops. I think after this, making another album might just be too much. Mm -hmm. But it's a very unusual album, extremely. It's, it int it's introspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, um, five, six, seven, almost biographical songs. Uh, this doesn't mean it's all within my comfort zone, because it isn't. And because I have um, Callum and I have Kate and I have Neil, it's musically interesting, but it is different from, it's going to be different from any album I've ever made. Uh, it's, it's a mature album and it's interesting because of the subjects. Yeah. I mean, one is, is, is regret through love, love lost.
then there's about being invisible when you're an older woman, that people just don't see you. Uh, there's one that that starts out rather raunchily and ends up being a song about ecology. Uh, there's one about people sitting on their phones and not communicating. Uh, there's a song about two people not getting along and it's and it's and it's uh, couched in the playing of a game called the puzzle, things like that. And a song about peace, a song about a teenage suicide. It's a very interesting album. I was um, curious about um, the title First Farewell and the fact that your autobiography is first time ever. Yeah. Um, do you do you feel able to approach creative projects with what they call beginner's mind? Does that does that help you? Do you find that you go into experiences seeing things afresh? No, I think that I think the seeing them afresh comes as you go along. Mm. Get an idea. I'm trying to get an idea at present. I'm part of a campaign to save the last uh, historic field in the village that I live in. It's being sold away for houses and it's right in the middle of the village. And I have to write a song about it and I'm trying to get an idea for it and I can't. I have to sit and brainstorm. I have to find some time to just brainstorm. And brainstorming is, is a fabulous way of writing a song. It really How is. How do you do it? Uh, I sit down with a recording machine and I just do free association the way you would on a psychiatrist's couch. And it doesn't matter what comes out. Uh, and that means that sometimes what comes out is a chord progression that you might use, or maybe a few ideas of a tune, or that it might be this kind of song, or let, I think maybe a slow three, four, or a, a, a fast three, four, or a slow six, eight. Let's put it in major and keep it within the space of a fifth, an, art, a, 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 an interval of a fifth. And then you go on to the next next thing. Well, it's the last tree in the last field, in the last village, in the last town that is safe from developers, you know, which is, I think, a big idea. Uh, and these things come out when you're not trying to write a song. These come out when you're just thinking about the whole subject. And I've put it up to the other members of the committee about you know, that I'm having tr trouble because I've been in writer's block for a year and they're giving ideas too. So using everybody's ideas and you just gather it all together and, it, and then you have to sort out what's the difference between a song and, and, and a poem, between a, a, a song and, and a political speech and turn it into something that is, that is different uh, or that... Songs are, are an unusual thing, you know. In Nora Jones, in her first wonderful um, uh, CD, which I just absolutely love, uh, one of the lines in it where she says, it's a love song, she says, I'll write you a song. And writing a song for somebody, for whatever reason, seems to be a huge compliment. It seems to be something that is a, a gift that is in a way more than writing a poem. It's more than writing a love letter. Writing a song, if it's a good song. <laughs> uh, songs have a, have a tremendous power. They do. Even when they, they seem to be very trivial or something that you can just hum to yourself as you walk around the house. Uh, so I'm looking at this list of the songs, there's 11 of them on, on the new CD, and there's two or three that I'm really, really proud of because they took me out of my box, completely out of my box. When I was a kid, uh, when I was seven, an eight-year-old uh, used to knock on our door and ask me to come out to play and we would go to the, the field of the four-leaf clovers and look for four-leaf clovers. And uh, he wasn't in my class, but uh, the whole uh, primary school went into a tizzy when he fell down in his class. He had a heart attack and died, my little comrade. 
and I never ever forgot that and I've I've incorporated that into it into a teenage love affair that went wrong and into old age I, I put the three things together and it's a very unusual song uh, I'm very proud of that one and did it all by myself didn't do it with other people but then I've usually written on my own you and McCall and I didn't write songs together we talked about making them talked about the approach but we never wrote a single song together that I didn't know with my present partner Irene who now lives in New Zealand and we talk every day we're still together but I'm we're together but not together uh, we did write songs together so uh, I'm I'm very proud of the ones in this that I did write on my own because two some of them are <laughs> unusual on this um, do you think that you, you'll be including any kind of response to the US election in a song for this record? Because it's kind of all that we can think of. I am fascinated by Trump. I'm fascinated by how he got to where he is. When Bush was president, the second Bush, I wrote a very, very small, tiny piece for him, which was based on a children's scatological piece from here. And it was about Bush who went to the Kyoto climate talks, stayed for a day and came home saying it wasn't good for USA businessmen. So I wrote that for him and then I remade it for Trump. It lasts a minute and it goes like this. Uh, we're way past this stage about talking about Trump. So I don't normally sing this, but this is the kind of thing, is a throwaway. Donald's in the White House with his bunch of tricks. Donald's in the White House with his bunch of pretty dire wheeler dealers at his beck and call. To think that they are dangerous is just a lot of balderdash and nonsense. What Donald doesn't want is sharing what he's got with a bunch of friggin' countries that are Muslim or just down on their luck. So Donald's in the White House to tell them all. It's funny how we thought that he was going to lose. But now he's in the White House, it's clear he's going to screw the people, screw the climate, screw the earth, and then make the world a safer place for Yankee businessmen. Now, at the time, that was the right thing to do. It's not the right thing to do now. He's not a joke anymore. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been a joke for two years now. He's mm -hmm. been a terrifying figure, uh, which is why I read so much about him, because if he had continued being president, and I think he has lost, I think America might have gone fascist. I really do. I think it was, and it may still, it may still. There's things happening in America that have been brewing ever since the Civil War. Absolutely. And, and before. And you talk a lot in your autobiography about your adventures in the 50s in, you know, in China and in Russia and all of these countries that you visited, but actually it seemed like some of the most hostility that you encountered was from the United States because of the fact that you'd visited Russia, visited China. And I wondered if you were feeling resonances from that time with what's going on now. No, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's all out in the open now in a way mm -hmm. that it wasn't in the open in the early 1950s. In the 1950s, it was mostly the cultural elite and the working class uh, far left wingers, the communists that McCarthy went after. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he didn't uh, encourage militias and, and gangs of, of gun-toting, mostly white men to beat up protesters. He didn't, he didn't do that. He went after the, the ones who were making films and songs and the ones who were, uh, were creating a political uh, credo mm. and trying to object to, what, to the whole Cold War idea. Because we've had several chances as a country, we, America, to really be a constructive leader. After the Second World War, America was, a, was Sir Galahad had come in, you know, after 9-11, um, we had a chance to really get the world behind us and, and talk about it as a world problem. Instead, you know, you know what he did. He went to Iraq and started bombing. Uh, 
so we we throw away possibilities. And I think if Trump had been elected a second time, I think it would have thrown away a possibility. I don't know what uh, Biden's going to do because America is now, there's a, a Trump cult that I think is going to continue. And I think Trump is going to keep traveling the country as long as he can, raising rallies, raising trouble. I think that's what he will do. I think that's what he'll do. And in terms of all the, the work that, that you and so, so many other brilliant women have done for feminism, did you have, you have you felt a sense of that being sort of unraveled steadily over the past four years? I think it has educated a lot of people who didn't vote the last time because a lot of people didn't vote for Hillary because they didn't like her. A lot of people have voted for Biden who don't really like him. They're just voting against Trump. Sure. Uh, the, I think he has unraveled himself. In terms of women making music and now being actually in a really important time for women to be making music, what advice would you give? I remember a joke I read recently. Here, take my advice. I don't need it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I would not presume to give anybody any advice. I really wouldn't. I wouldn't. It seems like in the book um, that you encountered the kindness of, of strangers over and over again and were kind of carried by that through some quite sort of dangerous and dodgy situations. And I, I wondered um, how far you tend to look for the best in people and how that has kind of helped you along the way and in your career. I've never been in, in danger excepting from police and demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I had a tooth knocked out and my glasses broken, but no, I, I do, I, yeah, I do look for good in people because I believe there is that, but then I've never met a, a manic killer. Uh, I've lived in a social milieu where people could afford to. You know, but often people who have the money aren't the not ones who are nicest to each other. Uh, I'm really taken at present by the amount of kindness that people show me, you know, phone me up. I'm an old person. They phone me up ask me, asking me if I'm okay. My mm -hmm. children phone more than they've phoned in years, which is very nice. Um, but neighbors phone, and I phone neighbors that are older than me or that are maybe the same or maybe living, I know they're living on their own. I've been phoning more old friends in this last eight or nine months than I've phoned in years because we're concerned about each other. But yes, I would say in this campaign that we're doing, I have proposed that we have a small video and just uh, the only sound uh, on it will be just a quick interview with people who walk down the high street in the village that I live in and who walk down to the, the lock. Because during COVID, this has increased hugely the number of people. And we're trying to keep the development from coming in because it would fill the village with cars. It, and it's, you can only go one, you can only go one lane on this, on this, the high street. And there, it would be gridlock if they put this housing thing in. So they, in the campaign, uh, they said, oh, you mean you'd stop people in the street and talk? I said, sure, you know? So I've already started doing that. Just stopping them and saying, uh, yeah, I've seen you walking along here quite often. Could I just have a word with you? And they, with the right, you know, attitude, they do, and they've said some lovely things. And you just hold your phone up to them and record them, and there you've got your sound. But 
but the many of the people I've been working with, I don't know that they would do that. Americans are bumptious. We really, we really go in where angels fear to tread. We do in all kinds of ways. And it's one of the things I really love about America is they approach each other so easily and quickly. It's pioneer stuff. And it's the same kind of thing that existed in this country when the, the Scots, for instance, I think way back, they had a rule that even if it was your worst enemy, you had to take them in if they were in need, you had to take them in for a year and a day. And the day after that, you could kill them. No, but uh, that was the rule. You, you gave hospitality to anybody who came to your door. And one of the songs that I sing, uh, the, the, the lover dresses himself up like, a, like a, a beggar and comes to the door of his true love on her wedding day to someone else. And she comes down, uh, she, she came twinkling down the stairs, gold rings on her fingers, gold bobs in her hair, a glass of wine all in her hand, all for to give to the beggar man. And that's what you did. When the beggar came to the door, you gave them something. You didn't slam the door in their face. Mm -hmm. That was the tradition that you helped the beggars. And this is coming back, not that we're beggars here, but, but when there is an evidence of need, and I'm always astounded by how many people drop money into the homeless cups in Oxford, and we have a lot of homeless in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And these houses they're proposing to build are not for the homeless. They talk about affordable, but affordable by whom? You know, what homeless person has 300,000 to pay for a two bedroom house? Yeah. Um, and in terms of, of the record and the idea that, it, that, it, that this is your first farewell, what would you like people to get from it? What, what's important to you about the way that it might be received? Do you see it as a, as a kind of a gift? No. Okay. No, an encouragement to spread things they probably know already, but don't know that they know. Because correlating things, um, one of the songs uh, is about... Um, people who, uh, it, it has an empty nester, a woman uh, who is, her children have all left home and she turns, tries to turn back the clock to when she was happy. And then there's a man who's out of work and he doesn't know who he is. He's a rudderless ship, a pawn in the game. He's losing himself, but he tries just the same to look for the, to look for, for what, uh, 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 to, to look for the place where everything goes, because we're trying to figure out where it all went in the past, where everything goes. And in the end, uh, it, it comes to a very short conclusion. There's no use looking for it because it's already here. It's in our heads. And if it's in our heads communally, then that means we have something that we share and that we need to to, 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 to share more than just thinking about sharing. Uh, so, so, so that's what hap what's ha it's happening with COVID. So many small organizations and collecting money. The food banks uh, boxes in the super supermarket, the, the, the people who shop for me, because I don't go into the shops at present. They say the food bank boxes are full and overflowing with people giving. Yeah. So uh, with the album, what I'm trying to do, or what we were trying to do, is to carry on what is an obvious sight. For instance, two people sitting at across from each other at the table, obviously a couple, and they're both on their phones, looking at their phones. And the song is called We Are Here. Look at me, be with me. I am here, you are here, we are here. And then at the very end, it says, we are all here. Are you listening? So um, 
what I would love to know is what's been um, the most meaningful compliment you've had about your music and your work? Wow. Personally meaningful, the one that's meant the most to you. Oh my goodness. One of the most meaningful things that they can do uh, at a concert is to start crying. And I have had that, a song that I sing called Everything Changes. Don't know if you've heard it. Uh, it's a song that I kind of wrote for my mother who died when I was 18. And it's a song about things just disappearing from your life. That is a huge compliment when you have reached down to something that makes people dig into their own experience enough to cry. Uh, of course, some people cry very easily, but I, I, I've, I, I, can't, I can't remember particularly. A lot of people say, thank you for this, thank you for that. I don't necessarily remember the wording of compliments, but it's nice that people do it. It's very, very nice. <laughs> Some of them are complimenting me for still going at 86. <laughs> uh, well, that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> it's hard every morning. I mean, today, my right foot is so swollen up, I can hardly walk on it. I say, well, you can thank me for getting up and walking today. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, but... It's funny to hear you say because you still seem so sparkling that I almost can't imagine you having a sore foot because it's not what's yeah. coming. Yeah. Well, um, you write songs for yourself and you hopefully put them in a way that reaches in, uh, in, into place where, where other songs might not reach because they are you, your songs are you. Mm -hmm. Everybody is unique. Every single person on earth is unique. There's no such thing as an ordinary person. I don't think so anyway. And so Joe Bloggs, whoever that is, I don't like the term, has something special to offer. If you just know how to mine it, if you just know how to get to it, I have something special to offer. The difference it might be is that I have a platform that I've, I have earned it. I could have done more to be famous, but to me, the, that thought of being famous is the pits. Oh, it's the last thing anybody would want. You know, I, I can't see why anybody wants to be famous. You no longer have a life. You know, you are what people think you are. You're not you. Yeah. And there's, yeah. Uh, I don't remember a particular compliment. But connection, it seems like it, it kind of boils down to connection. It's, it's your connecting deeply with yourself and that connecting deeply with the people who are, who are listening. And, and taking I'll it. tell you, when you're giving a concert, mm -hmm. there is a point at which you know you have reached everybody or you are wrote you have reached people when you're giving a concert there's a point at which you know that what you wanted to say has been taken in the way you wanted it taken in it's a magical moment and so i would say that and it's often just silence at the end of a song let's say that is probably the most wonderful compliment that a group of people who came as individuals, as community, can say thank you just by their existence there and their response. And it, it radiates to you. You can have a silence radiate at you in the most, <laughs> uh, and you let, it, you let it develop, you just let it sit there. And you realize what's happening is they're not just communicating with you. They're communicating with each other. 